My name is Jill Phillips and I'm the creator of Who's Shoes, a popular approach to co-production. I was named as an HSJ100 wildcard and want to help give a voice to others talking about their ideas and experiences. I'll be chatting with people from all sorts of different perspectives, walking in their shoes. If you are interested in the future of healthcare and like to hear what other people think, or perhaps even contribute at some point, Whose Shoes Wildcard is for you. So, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my friend Dr. Fazana Hussein, my very first podcast guest. Now, Fazana is GP of the Year. She's an amazing role model. She was absolutely, or is, innovative and inspirational during the pandemic. She's incredibly person-centred, and I believe, Fazana, that you were an HSJ wildcard yourself last year. I was. Um, <laughs> I, I love the way you've been prepared to just jump into the unknown here with me and start an adventure. So tell us a bit more about yourself and, and what's important to you. Well, thanks so much for having me, Jill, a fellow wildcard, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be your first guest. Um, so, uh, as you say, Jill, I, I've been a GP, it's my 20th year this year as a GP, uh, and I work in Newham in East London, and I trained there as a junior doctor as well, so it's my 24th year as a doctor. Uh, and I'm also a clinical director for one of our primary care networks, and primary care networks are like a grouping of a number of general practices, and um, the idea of that that came out in the 2019 long-term plan is that the, these primary care networks are very much based in the community at place level, looking after between 30 to 70,000 minus 67,000, and that we really work with our communities and with our hospitals, with our mental health trust to really integrate that work together. And I found the concept of that really exciting because for like 15, 16 years, I've been a GP and I just felt, Jill, that things that I was doing in my consulting room. It was very much in isolation. I felt I was part of a jigsaw puzzle, but I couldn't see the other parts. It's a very simple example. You know, some of my children with asthma, um, it's all very well giving them the inhalers, but actually if they're living in damp conditions in their house uh, and actually, you know, mum struggling and, you know, smoking is the only thing that gets her through the day because she's got so many other things. So those wider determinants of health and addressing them is really quite important to me because I don't think as a GP I can offer good health otherwise. So, so that's quite important to me, really, Jill. And of course, it's great to be on your podcast because you actually taught me a lot when I first met you through um, through the lovely Becky Morby, who I know is very passionate about communities and networks and all the great stuff she does at, at South Bank University um, as a professor. And Jill, before I met you, my experience of dementia had been very much, uh, well, the first thing was, oh, this is going to be a very long letter that I'm going to read from the hospital and this is going to take me a long time. And then it was, oh, this probably is a home visit. And the third thing was, oh my gosh, will the family tell me off because I'm not looking after this person properly? And those are all the anxieties that were going through my head as a, as a GP. And I think one of the things that you helped me with was with your great board game idea, you you made me realise that, sounds so obvious, doesn't it, but that actually people who suffer from dementia are people and that actually there's a lot of other assets out there that we as GPs can draw on. And, you know, just thinking about these people as frail old people who are extra work for us might not be the first thing to think about. Right, so that could even be one of that we mentioned before we started talking about leading up to some lemon light bulbs. So that could perhaps be the the first one. Could and be how... a lemon light bulb, a lemon <laughs> light bulb that when we think about, I mean, I'm using dementia as an example, but just when, when we think about somebody with an illness, and particularly as we're seeing a lot of complex conditions as we've got an aging population, that we maybe frame it differently to, oh, um, and, and I think something, you know, I am working in the NHS, I, I love the NHS, but I think something I would say the NHS perhaps doesn't maybe do as well as it could is that we very much start from a, a, a place of how can we empty the hospital beds? How can we save more money? 
And I wonder if we'll be better off starting thinking about how can we help so-and-so's mum who happens to have dementia live the best life she can. So it was because of you that I got interested in other things that people with dementia can have. And uh, then, of course, our mayor of London, Sadat Khan, talked about um, the, the, the London Museum being the first museum that's uh, dementia friendly. And I would wow. never have gone to visit that if it wasn't for you. And I had a great day out myself and I, I saw what they did. And it's helped me think about my, my patients in a more, they're people, these are not, you know, they're not, you know, lying, they're dying right at this moment, which is sadly, you know, one of the things I used to think of when I thought about dementia. So yeah, lemon light bulb moment would be for me even when we see a lot of illnesses, let's think about the person behind the illness. And if I were running the NHS, which I'm not, I would I would maybe start by thinking about that rather than how do we keep people out of hospital? That's brilliant. And I mean, it's been so reciprocal, I think the whole, whole relationship. And I mean, as you were talking there and about being interested in the social determinants of health and why people smoke and, and so on. One of the things I mentioned at the beginning that I've been so impressed by how you've been during the pandemic and I think a combination of, of yourself and there's a, a doctor on Twitter called Dr. Bob Kleber, who I find fascinating. And he's got a concept, be curious. And I think on one or two sessions, I've mentioned Fazana as a curious person. And I'd, I've absolutely loved the way that instead of just saying, COVID vaccination is good for you, you must have it. You've you've found out why, you've got into the shoes of, of your patients in terms of, you know, talking through with them what it is they're worried about. And as a trusted person, chatting that through with them and then naturally, I mean, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, Jill. So, you know, I consider myself a really nosy person. And I think that's a real positive thing if, you, if you're a GP. Um, you know, I think curiosity is is so important. And, you know, we kind of are born with that, aren't we? I think it gets knocked out of people. Because if you see little children, they're always curious, aren't they? Going into cupboards, looking at people. They're, they're curious. I think we're born with that ability. And I was noticing with the COVID vaccine, Jill, that, again, where I am in Newham, sadly, we had the highest COVID death rates during the first wave. And I I was noticing very early on in December, only about two, three weeks into the campaign, where at that moment we were still only vaccinating the over 65s and the extremely vulnerable. And in my own practice list, I run a list of 5,000 people, I noticed that uh, the over 65s that had been, only 50% of mine had been, and all the over 65s that had been were Caucasian, and all the over 65s that hadn't been were all either BAME or Eastern European. So it was so, um, it was so striking. And wow. I just thought, um, I, I wonder what's going on here. And I'm very fortunate, Jill. Um, I, I'm very blessed to be, I've been in my practice for 18 years and uh, I know a lot of them. And um, my, my over 65 numbers are quite small. Like I've got only 200 over 65. So we're talking about hundred people. And um, I started ringing them. I just thought, just again, out of curiosity, let's ring. And um, it was, uh, you know, various different reasons. I had, a you know, an African lady who's in her eighties who was, concerned about the long-term effects you know she was very concerned and I know her really well Jill and I said well if you grow a second head in 20 years time when you're 103 <laughs> I'm not a surgeon but I'll come and cut it off for you myself and we, because I know her we were able to giggle and her son was also very instrumental he wanted his mum to have it so I was having a joke with her and then I, I lost my own mum as you know Jill uh, when I was 19 and I said to her my mum would have been just a year older than you now she's not here but if she was here I would want her to have it and even though you're not my mum I would want you to have it three days later she had it and she rang us back to say she'd had it that's and, amazing and, and I think that's the I forget how blessed and privileged I am but also what a position what a great privilege and position it is that actually we have so much trust as GPs and I think it's part of our duty to do it I didn't get a success rate with everybody at the time Jill only like one in five went but as the months went I'm happy to say that my over 65 vaccination rate at the practice is over 75 percent double vaccinated and um 
the the rest of northeast london hasn't got that i mean we're still under 50 percent double vaccinated so it does show me the power of those individual conversations now i know that takes time and i'm, I'm not suggesting you know, all gps would have that time but um it, it certainly worked for us and i think it was a great piece of work so i'd definitely do it again you know now wow. that we know how many lives are being saved by the vaccine and I think what I'm hearing there is that you really know the patients with the combination of you call it nosiness, be curious, whatever it might be. But people appreciate that. And then the personalised care. So you couldn't write a manual saying, you know, if somebody's a certain age, you tell them in 20 years time. You know, that's such a personalised story. And it reminds me of I mean, obviously, I hear a lot of these stories through my work. So one of the mums that we work with, she's been a brilliant Matex kind of champion and leader. And her campaign became around hospital breastfeeding because she knew that she was very good at breastfeeding because the younger son had had serious heart problems and um, she got involved in in care where it became difficult to do what she needed to do as a mum in terms of breastfeeding. And her older son, the people in the hospital had nicknamed her Daisy as such a wonderful milk milk provider <laughs> now that seems to me a similar sort of story and you know what i love about the kind of properly um person-centered approaches is it's about having that relationship and knowing that person well enough to do something that's a little bit quirky or a little bit cheeky that's it cheeky, exactly yeah. Jill. again a lemon light bulb moment there's nothing that is a substitute for a good trusted relationship yeah uh, absolutely you can get away with cheek you can get away with so much and of course there's a lot of evidence that uh gps that that have continued to know their patients really well actually also reduce referrals and prescribing because you know they they know them and i think one of my one of my sadnesses is that I, as I see, um, I, I understand about, you know, corporate care, but I, I do worry that we're losing that smallness and that family medicine that we had in primary care. I hope that there's still a place for it. I, I think primary care networks um, offer a, a, a solution to a different issue. I think um, ICSs, big integrated care systems, offer different, but I think you need uh, a, an appropriate size for each place. And I, I'm sad to see that small practices are becoming a thing of yesterday because I don't think there is a there is a substitute for that trusted relationship. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting because I mean, people, you know, certainly of my age, used to talk in terms of my GP and you meant my GP it was the person that you saw whereas now it can you know at worst be a name on a bit of paper yeah. you know from that big practice you've been allocated to someone so yeah lots to think about isn't there lots lots to think about but I do think Jill that with the pandemic um I, I think that we've um accelerated in many ways um I think that you know they say don't they burning platform there was an absolute need for the whole world to function differently and, and um unless i've lived it jill i mean wow what a roller coaster the last 18 months has been but if you had asked me when i first met you you know fazana would you be able to like go fully you know online triage at your practice would you be able to do a drive-through clinic for your childhood immunizations would you be able to you know make all the changes i would say of course not jill and yeah. and and, and, I, and i think you know would primary care be able to do 75 percent of the, the the delivery of a vaccinating an entire country well i would just say you're off your rocker jill you know we're good we're not that good <laughs> but but it, it happened and it absolutely shows um you know well first of all how lucky i am to live in england and how great it is to be in the nhs because actually people pull together and it was again about those relationships, Jill. I had, um, you know, I had a, a consultant call me, which doesn't happen that much. <laughs> you know, we talk about integrated care, but we we are sadly, it's equally awful in primary care. We, we don't talk to the hospital that much. I had a consultant call me about a COVID patient and he said, oh, is it all right if I just talk to you? And I was like, yes. And I was waiting, I was waiting for what he was going to say. And he said, they don't need admitting. I just wondered, could you write them up some antibiotics for me and just review them in two days? I was like, yeah. And he said, can you? And I said, yeah, that's quite easy for me. And, and it just, it really made me think about how we really need to pick up the phone more with each other because he yes. thought he was asking me for a pot of gold. And this was actually 
easy piece of work for me. So um, I hope that continues again with the COVID vaccine, working with our councils, particularly working with our communities and you know faith groups, communities. That's been phenomenal. And I hope we don't lose that. I hope we can now do that for other things, um, you know, whether it's breastfeeding or obesity or whatever we, we want to talk about. And and hanging on to, to that, that, that good stuff. I mean, I think that was another point at which our paths crossed, because do you remember last year I was trying to develop virtual who shoes? And mm -hmm. basically that the plan was, I mean, I think one thing I really enjoy and there's good practice out there. There's great practice out there. People do things well and quickly. So you get perhaps the negativity about certain things. So my take on it is often, well, if you can share the good stuff, so-and-so is managing to do that. So-and-so is doing that. And whether that comes from the NHS or social care or from the community, I mean, obviously the community and the way they responded saved us in some ways. But at that early stage, I remember picking up, I mean, I think you're quite diffident in that you it wasn't just the NHS doing those various things. You were a leader in terms of, you know, certainly I saw the outdoor vaccination and the children's immunisations and so on. And I suppose what I loved about it was I really love simple things and things that we'd never have thought of in a million years. Actually, if you're trying to keep people apart or not spend too long in contact with each other, but this intervention is really, really important, you know, to give the child their jab. It's not rocket science, It's not is it? rocket science. And I think you've hit the nail on the head, Jill. And actually, sometimes those simple solutions are the ones that are the most effective. And often they come from the community because, again, I'm not trying to tell the NHS. I love the NHS. But something that we, as particularly as doctors, we're, we're very keen on evidence, Jill. Like, everything is evidence. But, and I understand that. I mean, you wouldn't want to put an injection of a drug in somebody without good evidence that it won't kill them. I understand that. But, but I also think that sometimes if we wait to look for evidence we can also hold ourselves back because somebody needs to do it to create evidence so if we all waited for evidence there was a hundred of us in the room and we all thought let's see the evidence and everybody waits then nobody's going to achieve anything because nobody's done anything to create any <laughs> evidence so sometimes i think and that's what i love about being a gp because we can be a bit more um rough and ready and we can work with our patients i didn't know if i was doing the right thing with the childhood immunization clinic Jill and we quickly realized that not everybody in Newham has a car so it's great to have a drive -through. yes so we quickly changed it to and a buggy through as well your buggy can be classed as a vehicle right. yes, yes. So, yeah. so our little kiddies were coming in in their buggies and I was vaccinating a, a, a my, my nurse and I were both out there in our front garden and it was a bit windy and I said to to dad dad had brought little one in and I said only a four month old and I said I'm really sorry I hope he's not too cold you know we're just like trying this out and the dad is the person who I'll always remember it was only our second week doing it and he said doctor we're all learning and I know you're doing your best yeah and that, that meant a nice. lot to me it meant a lot because I wasn't quite sure and I still feel emotional about that because he I needed to hear that from him he said we're all learning doctor and I know you're doing your best you know, that's and, really nice. And, and that was March 2020, and our vaccination rates went up because our vaccination rates had gone down, Jill. And we know that measles had made a comeback in London a few years ago, anyway. And that was my fear that we're in the middle of a pandemic with COVID, and now we're going to get other infectious diseases resurging where we do have vaccines. So it was really important to me that we keep our kiddies safe. And I think, you know, it's another lemon light bulb that feedback from the community that it's not all one way is it that you know you need that reinforcement you need that support you know that that's really nice to hear and I'm glad that that you know I'm sure he'd be delighted that that's kind of like stuck with you it's in that been way. so important and I think now when we are all feeling a bit jaded and tired after 18 months and we know that um, you know a lot of people have waited for their GP appointments during lockdown and we're seeing this real like there's been a 25 percent increase this is the time where now we need to work together with our communities because sometimes under times of stress it becomes a bit tribal and you can see oh those patients are asking for too many appointments and it's those gps are not seeing us face to face and actually the, the answer is if we talk to each other and you know both of us need a reassurance i hope that we do that more as we get to integrated care systems and we don't 
continue perhaps sometimes that patriarchal matriarchal nature that the nhs and doctors have had you know you've come to see the doctor and i know and i will tell you what to do because i don't think that works no the whole shared decision making i think you know in terms of the work that we do seeing the power of people who perhaps come along to a workshop as complainants and expecting perhaps I I don't know to have a battle or not be heard or whatever I think one of the key things I've seen throughout all of our work is as soon as people realize that the healthcare professionals are actually very keen to listen properly and to value the people and value their perspectives then it's almost like a balloon sort of coming down that instead of everyone being kind of like defensive and then they realize well that the healthcare professionals have got problems as well and and we're all human together and then you you can almost sort of feel the collective relief that we then just start talking to each other as human beings and it's amazing then anything's possible at that point Mm -hmm. and very often the outcomes aren't things that you'd have predicted at the beginning and sometimes it worries me if people want you know an apparent in inverted commas co-production workshop but to achieve a certain outcome well actually the co-production needs to determine what the it outcome is, the yeah. level scope. Yeah. A bit like our podcast here. You know. Yeah, we're just like learning as we go. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, fun in that. I, I do think that requires people to let themselves be a bit vulnerable. And again, you've said a light bulb thing there again, that like we were talking about trusting relationships. And we're talking about the same thing again, aren't we? That we, we need to trust the people that we're looking after, that they also I, I might have a bit more scientific tech knowledge because I've been to medical school just like if I take my car in to be serviced I'm expecting the the car mechanic will know more about the car than me but but otherwise like I'm here to provide a bit of the the knowledge and and then think about what my patients want to do and I think that I think we lose that a bit sometimes. And I think this is a really good time to do it, Jill, because now that obviously primary care networks are here, we're two years old, we've got a a lot of supporters, GPs, with our additional staff. So we've got pharmacists, we've got physicians associates, and we've got social prescribers. And social prescribers are people who um, are not medical, and I think that's an asset. And they really think about the whole person and what they might or might not need. And I think that's a brilliant role. And I think that has enhanced care for our people and our patients. And I'm I'm hoping that that's going to span out, actually. I mean, we're in our network looking at uh, getting a specific young person's social prescriber now. Um, wow, that so sounds interesting. Yeah. One. So, so because we're quite a young borough and we've got issues like, uh, you know, knife crime and, and, and other things. And, you know, everybody's got a lot of mental health that are, are affecting young people. So I, I think that uh, that's quite an exciting thing. And I, I do think that I might say this because I'm a GP, but obviously I'm in the community. I, you know, I live in Newham, I work in Newham, Newham is very important to me. And, and I think sometimes, again, we spend a lot of time in the NHS talking about getting people out of hospital and how much it costs for the 89 year old with five different illnesses to be in hospital. But what are we doing for our young people and that prevention thing? Because their lives are no less important. Um, and just because they don't, spend a lot of time in hospital in bed doesn't mean that they're not important so if it was up to me I would try and turn that on its head and really look at that prevention agenda and also think about what we can do in the community and how the community can help us. And probably particularly after the pandemic I would guess in that we've all thought about protecting older people and children and young people have you know been safer from COVID, but missing their education, missing their friends. You know, I'd like to see a lot of focus going on on young people in terms of making up for, for all that they've lost, really. Absolutely, Jill. And just as a parent of a 17 year old and an 18 year old, I forget what a big portion of their life 18 months has been because me at 48, it, it, two years doesn't seem that long when you're my age. But I forget that, you know, my, my 17 year old didn't see GCSE. She didn't say goodbye to her friends. I went to yeah. a different sixth form and I hadn't fully understood like how angry she was about that. 
and yeah. and how she you know she desperately wants to see her friends and go out a lot more now and and you know she hasn't got a diagnosable mental health issue but many of my young people have and I wonder about many of my patients who aren't coming forward because of course they could deteriorate they're only young people that their whole lives are ahead of them. And I think in terms of you know you use that phrase diagnosable mental health condition and I suppose part of the work that I'd hope to do and you know, perhaps particularly a role for this podcast series might be to think about how the NHS needs to concentrate on wellness and well-being as opposed to just illness and, you know, the opportunity to reach out to the community. I mean, I suppose I've got this dream of just like linking everything up and the community is a very big part of that and the people who are well at the moment. But, you know, if you don't give them any, you know, not necessarily NHS support, but general support, then they'll become ill and they'll come into the system. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, you, we were talking before we came on, weren't we, about what would you say to, to you know, the, the, the new CEO of the NHS? And of course, now we know it's Amanda Pritchard. And I had the privilege of meeting her before the pandemic. Um, I was fortunate to be invited to a, a roundtable event on um, ICS. And she was just so lovely. She was just so, like, I went and said hello. And she was just so down to earth and just so just normal and lovely so I think we're very fortunate to to have her and obviously the the first woman to run the NA it's fantastic um but if we're really going to think about the wellness agenda now it, it, we have to do exactly as you say we, we need to think about what can we put in and it doesn't necessarily need to be NHS but those little interventions I think will have huge gains um, and you know people around the country are doing it you were talking earlier about pockets of good practice you know I know in the northwest uh, you know they've had mental health cafes for a number of years and sometimes if somebody just has that that's not a huge resource but you might be actually saving somebody going into a psychiatric hospital years down the line, you know, you might not be, but you might be. Um, And I think we just need to prioritise that as well, because I think these are quite quick wins that aren't even particularly expensive. And I think sometimes I understand when you're on a tight budget, as obviously the NHS is, you probably think about your biggest spends. But I wonder if we should also be looking overall and looking at the long term thing of if we keep these guys well, not only do we increase their quality of life, we probably save a lot of money as well. Yeah. Lots to think about. Um, I was reading a blog. I don't know if it's only come out today, but I read it today. Sam Allen has written a blog about the new chief executive and delighted that she's a woman, et cetera, et cetera, but that that's only part of the story. And I was thinking, you know, I've set up this podcast series specifically as a result of being named as a wild card. and, And the brief was basically people who'd have something to say to the new chief exec. And I'm thinking, poor woman she's going to have her ears battered from every direction and you know whether she'll ever get a chance to listen to my podcast but I think she'll gain something if she does I think the three things mentioned in this article that she would need was support and time and resources so we can all have all these fantastic ideas but she's only a human being as well and actually to run a service that's properly resourced and with you know the right priorities is key definitely support time and resources and that time is always something we feel very short of and I think it's up to each one of us in the NHS to support her with that as well you know with the communication and the feedback and then I guess someone like me uh, who's a GP seeing patients on the front line is then to also get that feedback from our community so it's a chain isn't it and because we do all need to do this together it isn't like one person's uh, issue it's a whole society issue and I think never more important now than the period we're in living in a pandemic. So it's another key message, do things together. Do things together, yeah. I'm really enjoying these lemon light bulb moments, trusted relationships, <laughs> do things together. And certainly that feedback we get from our patients is, is priceless. It does keep us going. That's amazing, Fazana. Was there anything, I'm just thinking, we mentioned time just then. We'd sort of set ourselves a notional 30 minutes. Is, is there anything you think that we've... I mean, obviously, we could talk all day, but is there <laughs> No, I, th- I think I've chatted away there. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed that. Okay, well, that's the end of our first guest podcast. I'm over the moon with speaking to, to you, Fazana, as the first session. And let's hope the podcast series makes a, a big difference to 
improving healthcare and lots of interesting chats and connections. Thanks for having me, Jill. Take care. Thank you, Fasana. I hope you have enjoyed this episode. If so, please subscribe now to hear more of these fascinating conversations on your favourite podcast platform. And please leave a review. I tweet as Who's Shoes. Thank you for being on this journey with me. And let's hope that together we can make a difference. <laughs>